Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this very special RAND Remote event. I'm Joel Hyatt, a member of the Board of Trustees at RAND and the chair of RAND's capital campaign, Tomorrow Demands Today. We're honored to be hosting this conversation today with former Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, and Tom Kalina, the policy director at the Plowshares Fund. They're going to be talking about nuclear executive authority in their new book, which is entitled, The Button, The New Nuclear Arms Race and Presidential Power from Truman to Trump. The decision to launch America's nuclear arsenal rests solely with the president. Secretary Perry and Tom will be talking about the implications of having the power to end the world in the hands of one person who can simply push a button. Today's conversation will be driven by students at the party ran graduate school, including students whose research and dissertations are on national security topics. And now I'll turn things over to Susan Marquis. Susan is the Dean of the Party Rand Graduate School and also the Vice President of Innovation at the Rand Corporation. And Susan will get the discussion started. Thank you, Joel. It's my honor to be here with our esteemed guests, Secretary William Perry and Mr. Tom Kalina. As Joel mentioned, an impressive group of Party Rand Graduate School students have recorded questions for our guests. Before we get to the question and answer, Secretary Perry and Mr. Colina will share a brief presentation on their book, The Button. Uh, hi, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and I hope that's working, yes. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, as Susan said, I'm Tom Colina. I'm policy director at the Plowshares Fund. Uh, and I had the honor of writing this book with uh, Secretary Perry. We wrote this book as a blueprint uh, for what the Biden administration could do on nuclear weapons. So let's get to the central question. What should President Biden do to reduce the risk of nuclear war? And first, some context. Uh, nuclear policy does not happen in a bubble. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration is facing unprecedented challenges from the coronavirus to racial injustice to global warming and other issues. It's gonna take mountains of money to tackle all these crises and we will likely need to spend it. Um, the US government has already spent over $4 trillion on COVID and economic recovery uh, just in the last year. So we need to ask, are any of these challenges addressed by nuclear weapons? And the answer is clearly not. Uh, yet the United States is planning to spend well over a trillion dollars to rebuild its nuclear arsenal. And to us, this makes no sense. Uh, the Biden-Harris team can and should redirect a large chunk of this funding to address the more pressing needs that we mentioned. This, however, is not just about money. Uh, we need to change policy too. The bomb does not address the most serious threats we face. Uh, in fact, it makes those threats even worse. So let's, let's unpack this a bit. Uh, here is former President Trump with the infamous football, the briefcase that contains everything the president needs to start a nuclear war. Uh, presidents can order an attack on their own authority, no second opinions required from Congress or the Secretary of Defense. Uh, but ultimately, this is not just about President Trump. Uh, all presidents make mistakes, all are human. Uh, and that is why no single human should control the future of humanity. And therefore, we must change the policy of sole authority. And we, the American people, choose to give presidents this absolute power, and we can take it away. Uh, so let's talk about how. In our book, we make a number of uh, central arguments. First is that US policy is focused on the wrong threat of a surprise attack from Russia. Uh, we believe such an attack is highly unlikely for the simple reason that it would mean the utter destruction of both sides. Uh, and yet US nuclear policy has been based on this threat for decades. So here's the big problem, that this mistaken threat assessment increases the risk of blundering into nuclear war by mistake. We could start nuclear war in response to a false alarm, one of the greatest dangers in the world, and we simply don't need to take this risk. Third, uh, we must move away from quick launch policies and give the president 
more decision time. So Bill, turning to you, you had a front row seat on the arms race and met with Soviet and Russian officials many times. Some might challenge our central assertion that a surprise attack from Russia is not a likely threat. What would you say to that? Simply that the Russians, whom I know very well, I've met with many, many times, I can say with confidence, are neither stupid nor are they suicidal. Therefore, they're not going to launch a surprise attack because they know it would end in their own destruction. Um, so this perceived threat of a surprise attack, as unrealistic as it may be, drives the military requirement that we must be ready to launch nuclear weapons at all times within minutes. Uh, and that in turn drives three dangerous policies. The president, as we mentioned, has sole authority to launch nuclear weapons within minutes with no second opinions or oversight. The president can order a first strike and is not limited to retaliation. And third, the president can launch hundreds of land-based ballistic missiles, ICBMs, on warning of attack without waiting for proof of attack. Uh, Bill, could you give us your sense of why this combination of policies is so dangerous? I can do that best by relating an incident in my own life. During the Cold War when I was under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, I was awoken at three o'clock in the morning by a phone call. The voice on the other end of the line identified himself as the watch officer at the North American Air Defense Command. And he told me that his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. I'll never forget that phone call. He immediately, happily, went on to tell me that he had determined there was a false alarm. And that, but before he determined that, he was calling me. Why was he calling me? I was not in the chain of command. He was calling me because he wanted to get my opinion as to what was going wrong with his computer. He wanted to get an analysis of why his computer had given him a false hit reading. But before he called me, he had called the pre president's office. It's three o'clock in the morning. Before the watch officer had awoken the president, they had finally determined there was a false alarm. So the president did not have to make the decision, but had they not, had it taken two or three minutes longer to do that, the president would have had to decide whether or not to launch our ICBMs before they were destroyed in their silo. So this is an event which you'll say is best I can think of how dangerous this policy is. So what can we do about these dangers? Um, President Biden must reorient US nuclear policy away from a Russian surprise attack uh, and instead focus on preventing accidental war. And Bill, please, out, please, sorry, Bill, please lay out our main arguments for how to do this. The most important single action we can take is to end what is called sole authority. Only the president, the president by himself with no other consultation, he has, he's allowed to consult, but he has not required to consult, can on his own launch nuclear weapons. That's a very dangerous policy for reasons we've already discussed. The danger that a president might either be operating on false information, the president might be unstable at the time, and maybe even temporarily unstable because of drugs or because of heavy alcohol use, which has happened several times with, with, with presidents. So the most important thing is to end the sole authority. Start with that one. We can prohibit first use and should prohibit first use. That removes one of the great dangers and it's an NSA Policy we have today allowing us to, 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 to fire weapons first. I cannot imagine us ever using, but because we have it, there's a danger that we will blunder into using it. Finally, all of this danger is focused on one of our weapons, which is our land based ICBMs. They are the ones which we would launch first. They are the ones which, if we got a 
an alarm of an attack coming, which turned out to be a false alarm, those are the ones that we would launch. So they are a danger and a very serious danger. And beyond that, we don't need them. We already have submarines, which are relatively invulnerable to attack and bombers, which can provide sufficient deterrence. So we want to phase out our land-based ICBMs. Thank you. Uh, so to wrap up the Biden administration and the current national crisis to us, uh, we feel should inspire us to rethink our approach to national security. And US nuclear policy is actually doing us more harm than good by magnifying the dangers we face from the most likely nuclear threat, blundering into nuclear war by mistake. Uh, President Biden can and must fix this. We know this will be hard. We're up against 75 years of outdated thinking and a $50 billion industry. History tells us that major change like this is only possible if led by the president with public pressure to deliver. Uh, so we are looking to educate the Biden administration and the public like you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm uh, excited to say today we're gonna to do something a little different than we do normally with Randy events. We are going to uh, feature questions from some of our party ran graduate students. Um, our first question comes from Noah Johnson. Noah is a third year graduate student. He comes to us by way of Merrill Lynch and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, I should note that his dissertation research is on increasing men's utilization of parental leave in California. And Noah, in fact, had, he and his wife had their first child just recently during COVID. So he was able to bring his research to life uh, in, during this last experience. All right, let's see what Noah's question is. Secretary Perry and Mr. Kalina, thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Currently, the president has sole launch authority for nuclear weapons, which does not allow for a check against a poor decision by a single individual. If we were to move to a different paradigm for authorizing nuclear launches, what do you think it should look like? If it is by committee, which government and or military officials should be part of it? And what would command and control look like under this new system? Well, an obvious person to consult for the president to consult would be the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State. Uh, but I believe he should consult beyond people who report to him. And so I would think it's very important that we have some key members of Congress involved in that consultation too. Perhaps the uh, top four members of Congress, the uh, leader in the House and the leader in the Senate from both parties. Now, do, to do so, of course, would take time. He not, he's not gonna be able to make a three minute response or five minute response. And many people have pointed out that's the disadvantage of the consultation. In my point of view, that's an advantage, not a disadvantage. I think the most dangerous thing we can have is a quick launch, a launch before we have a time to take all information into account. Um, in short, I think the quick launch policies we have are perhaps one of the greatest dangers and we should get rid of them in, in any event. Tom, what do you say? Just to add, you know, the thing we're really concerned about is, is presidential sole authority for first use. So you can kind of address either part of those. Um, so one approach to this would be to, as, as Bill mentioned earlier, to prohibit the first use of nuclear weapons. If we had a no first use policy, then we wouldn't worry about sole authority for first use because first use would, would be prohibited. We can go the other way as Bill was talking about and just go after the sole authority piece. And here I would just make the point agreeing with Bill that you wanna have people uh, in a, additional decision makers as part of that that are uh, civilians in the legislative branch, so Congress, and, and specifically people who are not hired or fired by the president, uh, who are independent, uh, independently elected officials. So as, as Bill said, it could be the most senior uh, legislators in Congress. Uh, it could be all of Congress um, after a, a declaration of war. And as Bill said, it's, it's not a matter of how fast you can do this, because actually what we're trying to do is uh, build in more decision-making time, create more time for a president and others to make a decision about nuclear response. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Omer Khan. Uh, prior to joining Party Rand, Omer was a data analyst and survey researcher at MailChimp. He 
He earned a bachelor's in economics from Georgia State and a master's from the University of Michigan. His research interests are, uh, include US foreign policy, civil conflict, and social movements. And his dissertation, dissertation research is on use of forced decisions, so completely appropriate for this topic today. Uh, let me turn it over to Omer. Secretary Perry and Mr. Kalina, it's a pleasure to speak with you. As you've written, some members of Congress have introduced bills to create formal checks on the president's authority, but these bills have failed to attract significant support. How can we convince Congress that they should assert their authority? Or more concretely, how can we structure their political costs and benefits so that they want to have veto power over the use of nuclear weapons? Tom, I pass that one to you. That's a tough one. <laughs> it is a tough one. Um, and it's a great, it's a great question. Um, part of this is that members of Congress rarely do anything unless they feel pressure from their constituents to do it. Um, and, and even though there was quite a bit of public concern about President Trump uh, having his finger on the button, uh, I don't think members of Congress felt that strongly enough um, to bring real pressure uh, on the leadership of Congress or on the president to do anything about it. Now, we, we've had some signs of that pressure. Uh, 30 members of Congress recently wrote a letter to President Biden asking him to take a look at presidential sole authority and what he might do about it. Uh, but, it but, you know, 30 is not a majority um, it's not enough. I think something that could really change the dynamics here is if the president himself uh, started to support efforts to review sole authority and look for ways to limit that authority. And, and sure, you know, no president wants to limit their own authorities, uh, including not in the nuclear realm. But I think the way for, the, for President Biden to see this is to recognize uh, we could have future prospects of an unstable leader with his finger on the button. And it is up to President Biden uh, as a more level-headed thinker to foresee that possibility in the future and take efforts now to limit sole authority. Secretary Perry, anything you'd like to add? No, I, I agree completely with what Tom just said. Okay. All right, next up we have Kurt Klein. Kurt has a master's in public policy and a bachelor's in physics from the University of Michigan. Um, his research interests include uh, defense planning, nuclear issue, terrorism, violent extremism, infrastructure planning, and climate resilience. I should note that prior to party ran, Kurt took a break to live in South America and made a living as a professional gambler. And with this, uh, with this money, he established a nonprofit in Africa to support children there. So uh, one of our typical party ran students, without a doubt. So Kurt, let me turn it over to you. You recommend to bring the topic of nuclear disarmament into the new mass movement that is focused on topics and policy changes that are typically advocated by the American political left. Do you see any potential to find synergies advocating for nuclear disarmament with policy positions on the American political right? What might those be? That's a hugely difficult question because it's hard to imagine any issue on which we get agreement between the left and the right today. The, the division, the political division in our country is so deep and so profound today that they can't seem to agree on the simplest issue. The recent votes in the Senate and the Congress on the, um, the new COVID relief bill in, indicate that it was a zero Republican support for it. It was a completely party line vote. So that's the biggest issue we have today. If we could solve that issue, there are many other things we could do, but I don't know how to solve that issue. Tom, do you have anything you could say that about what to do about that issue of political divide today? Uh, no, that's certainly uh, above my pay grade, but but my pay grade. But I would certainly say that it hasn't always been this way, right? I mean, uh, reducing nuclear dangers used to be a bipartisan enterprise, uh, and in fact, the first presidents that, that took this on were Republican presidents, whether it be Nixon uh, or Reagan or the first President Bush, um, who saw the dangers of uncontrolled arms races. 
um, and the amount of money that we were wasting on an arms race that could be better spent on other things. Um, and they were the ones that sat down to negotiate treaties with the Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, that ended the nuclear arms race. So, so the understanding is there, the potential is there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in current times, the polarization has made that kind of bipartisan activity impossible. Um, but my hope is that uh, as we seek to rebuild the political center, we can get back to that. But, but as Bill said, it's, it's not going to happen right away. It, this is a multi-year enterprise, but, but the history is there and hopefully the muscle memory is there too of how to do this in a bipartisan way. So Diana Myers, who's up next, she's an Air Force uh, lieutenant, lieutenant in the United States Air Force, a graduate of the Air Force Academy. She's in her second year at Cardi Rand, and she already knows she will be serving as an intelligence officer after she graduates. So let's uh, turn it over to you, Diana. What's your question? In the book, you highlight the vulnerabilities in our systems to properly detect and respond to potential attacks. As a country that guarantees its nuclear umbrella to numerous partners and allies overseas, how do we adequately signal our resolve to bridge these gaps in our capabilities and reassure them of our agreement to provide extended deterrence? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and say, you know, first of all, I think it's very important that we, the United States, reassures our allies that we'll be there when they need us. And that's so important now because of the last four years of the Trump administration raising questions about that with the allies. So there's, there's no doubt that we have a, an assurance deficit, if you will, uh, and that the Biden administration needs to shore that up. Uh, but I would say that doesn't have to happen with nuclear weapons. And, and in fact, we're hearing a lot of arguments now saying that, oh, we can't possibly declare uh, a no first use policy. We can't possibly cancel the new ICBM or reduce our spending on nuclear weapons because the allies uh, will we'll get skittish about our commitments and then they'll, they'll build their own nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I simply don't buy that. You know, the United States needs to determine its own national security policies based on its own national security needs. We can't give our allies veto power uh, over our policies, particularly when they're not paying the bills that are quite large. Uh, and so we need to figure out, you know, for our own national security and for our own budget priorities, what makes sense for us. Uh, and if some of those decisions um, uh, lead to discomfort among the allies, then let's address those uh, discomforts by reassuring the allies that we're there for them. And, and I'll just take the example of no first use. You know, um, the US extended deterrent depends on the US ability uh, to deter a nuclear attack against our allies. That does not require the first use of nuclear weapons. That requires the assured second use, retaliation. Uh, so we're saying that if any of our allies are attacked with nuclear weapons, we will come to their defense, retaliate on their behalf. There's nothing in there that says that we will use nuclear weapons first on their behalf. Uh, and so we just need to reassure allies in other ways through conventional force <laughs> deployments, troop deployments, financial commitments, uh, diplomatic commitments, um, so there are many ways to reassure the allies we should do that, but it doesn't have to be with nuclear weapons. I'd simply like to underscore the point Tom made about the allies' concern on this. When I was the secretary, we were considering adopting a no first use policy. And in the midst of those deliberations, I had um, representatives from both Germany and Japan come to me and argue that we should not do that because it would weaken extended deterrence. First of all, their argument was wrong. It did not weaken extended deterrence for the reason that Tom has just given. So I tell you that just to point out, it's a very real concern and we have to be able to deal with that concern as we move forward. Uh, I'd like Tom's description of how we deal with it, but we have to understand the problem is there. It's a real problem. We do not want uh, deterrence to resolve from these actions. So we have to as we go ahead with them, we have to find a way of dealing with this deterrence issue as well, with this possibility of um, other countries going ahead and, and, going to, and going nuclear. We do not want that to happen. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me turn now to one of our second year students, another one of our second year students, Max Steiner. Uh, Max's work, his uh, professional work has been on national defense and diplomacy. 
He's attending Hardy Rand while on leave from the Department of State where he's an economic officer within the Foreign Service. He is, also has combined 14 years of active and reserve duty in the US Army. His dissertation is looking at uh, the UN aid spending and voting. Let's hear what Max has to say here. Sir, one of your major recommendations is for the United States to commit to a no first strike policy on nuclear weapons. You make a convincing argument that U.S. security is not threatened by such a commitment. But I am concerned that a no first strike policy will undermine the deterrent effect of U.S. pressure on China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan or Russia vis-a-vis -vis the Baltics. All of these allies would be hard to defend on a short timeline with conventional forces alone. Would renouncing a first strike option undermine our relationship with smaller allies that depend on our nuclear umbrella for security? As a follow-up question, how would Russia and China interpret a move towards greater strategic restraint by the United States even as they begin to more forcefully challenge the status quo rules-based international order? Uh, I think really just the opposite, that I know that a um, the fact that we do not have a no first use policy stimulates other countries to have no <clears throat> to, to resist that as well. And moreover, it, to the extent that Russia believes that we might strike first, then in a crisis, they might be impelled, they might feel impelled to, to actually go first themselves. So I think our no first, <clears throat> having no first use policy saves, avoids that danger. And it's very important, I think, that. Um, if we have no first use, then our relationship with other nuclear powers is actually improved and the likelihood that they will go first is, re is greatly reduced. The danger of no first use, not having no first use in particular is in a crisis. In a crisis, Russia in particular might feel that we might go first and then try to beat us to the punch. So the no first, <clears throat> the no first use policy avoids that danger. Tom? I would just add, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of controversy about no first use, but ultimately it's a very common sense proposal if you think about it this way. I mean, the United States never wants to be in the position of starting nuclear war. Uh, we have the strongest conventional forces in the world. If we move from conventional to nuclear war, we are immediately at a disadvantage uh, and we have no idea where that crisis is gonna go and it could ultimately end up destroying you know, the United States and the rest of the world with it. So the United States simply has no interest in moving to nuclear war, starting nuclear war. Uh, and if that's the case, why would we use nuclear weapons first? We're simply saying through a no first use policy, it's not in our interest to start nuclear war. Uh, we are not giving up on deterrence. So we're not saying we won't use them second as retaliation as a deterrent. We're simply saying starting nuclear war is insanity. Uh, as President Reagan said so many years ago, nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. We must never start nuclear war. So therefore, why hold on to a policy uh, that we're never going to use and only makes our adversaries fear that we will launch a surprise attack? Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce to you now uh, the last of our Party Rand students joining this conversation. Mike Gaines is a US Marine Corps veteran. He's had uh, more than 10 years of active service and 23 years of total service. His professional experience prior to joining Party Rand uh, centered on national security decision making and strategic and operational level intelligence. Mike holds a BA in history from the University of Memphis, a master's in logistics management from Florida Institute of Technology, and a master's in strategic intelligence from the National Intelligence University. All right, let me turn it over to Mike. The triad and assured retaliation have helped to ensure stable peace between great powers for over 75 years. How would removing a leg from the triad, i.e. the ground-based strategic deterrent, affect sure retaliation, and furthermore, the extended deterrence umbrella. Would it just encourage our nuclear pow powers to produce more attack submarines and more nuclear submarines? Or worse, encourage more entrance into the nuclear club as the extended deterrent provided by the triad is, as, is perceived as more fragile? Well, just to start out, I mean, 
eliminating the land-based leg uh, of the triad, as we recommend in the book, um, shouldn't have any effect at all on strategic stability, except in a positive way. Um, in other words, in the same way that we describe the dangers of a first use policy, the ICBMs, the land-based missiles, are the first use weapon of a first use policy. Uh, these are the weapons that a president would launch when we're under attack, um, possibly, and there's pressure to launch those weapons before the attack arrives which raises the possibility that we would start nuclear war by mistake if a president were to perceive an incoming nuclear attack that turned out to be a false alarm. Uh, and as Bill has said, we've had multiple false alarms in the past. So this is not just an academic exercise. Uh, so the ICBMs create this danger of, of starting nuclear war by mistake. At the same time, we don't need them for deterrence. And, and here's the way to think about it. Uh, if we could just snap our fingers and make all the ICBMs go away, would Russia feel emboldened enough to attack the United States? And the answer is, of course not, because we have 14 submarines, uh, most of which are out at sea at any given time. Each one of those submarines could destroy the 50 largest cities in Russia right now. And again, we have 14 of them. Uh, so how you know, and, and, and so that's the case without any ICBMs at all. So from my perspective, ICBMs are not needed for deterrence. We have plenty of weapons in the sub force and in the bomber force to maintain deterrence with Russia. And at the same time, by getting rid of them, we would reduce this danger of stumbling into war by mistake. And oh, by the way, we'd save a ton of money because the new generation of ICBMs is gonna cost this country $264 billion over their lifetime. Again, money we'd much rather spend on higher priorities. Secretary Perry, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, I would only add to that, that the possible comeback to what Tom has just described is what if our submarines become vulnerable or if they can be attacked? I can say that's a question which we have been asking ever since I was under Secretary of Defense back in the 1970s. And nobody has ever yet found a way of, of attacking those submarines successfully. That doesn't mean it can never happen, but it does mean that we need to keep our anti-submarine warfare program very, very um, up to date. We need to continue R&D and anti-submarine warfare to be sure that we maintain the submarines. And we also need to be ready if we think there's a danger to submarines, to put our bombers on, some of our bombers on air alert. We don't keep them on air alert today for very good reason. But if there were, if it were a compelling reason to put them on air alert, we could do that. Okay, thank you. But if I could just add that we're also investing another $100 billion in a new generation of submarines that are even quieter and harder to find than our current generation. So we're certainly investing a lot of money uh, in keeping our subs invulnerable. Oh, yeah, this submarine, anti-submarine warfare competition has been going on for many, many decades and will continue to go on. But as my, to this point, and as my judgment will continue, the advantage lies with the submarines. It's much easier to find a way to keep the submarines quiet than it is to find a way of attacking them. And we should work hard at our anti-submarine warfare R&D to make sure that continues. All right, thank you. Uh, I believe Diana Myers has another question. Uh, let me turn it back to Diana. The illustration you provided of the U.S.'s current nuclear weapons deployment protocol and the button highlight the alarming fragility of the nuclear security paradigm in which we operate. The escalation scenarios you provided in the book raise an interesting question about the command and control structure of other nuclear weapon states, particularly those of China and Russia. As important as it is for the U.S. to ensure safeguard mechanisms in our launch protocol, it seems just as important for other nuclear weapon states to similarly adopt robust C2 structures to properly manage escalation. In your assessment, what do you think is the best way for the U.S. to engage other nuclear weapon states to visit and possibly revise their C2 protocols? Well, I think her, the statement is exactly correct. And for that reason, we put a huge emphasis on maintaining the viability of our command and control. I have to admit though, I do not know how 
it's just important as is, is the uh, as she says it's just important for other nations to maintain the integrity of their command and control system i don't know how we can affect that really it's a very touchy issue it's, it's hard to imagine another country giving us access to their command and control system so so we could actually work to help them improve it so it's a tough problem for which i do not know of a solution tom do you can you think of any solution to that well, the only thing I can think of is, is by adopting policies ourselves to encourage other countries to do the same thing. Um, so, for example, um, you know, getting away from, from sole authority, uh, getting away from first use, which should help relax pressures on a command and control systems, and in particular, getting away from launch on warning. Uh, you know, this is something that, that is a danger for us. Uh, it's a particular danger in, in Russia, where we have reason to believe that Russia's early warning system is less capable than ours. And so the Russians have even less time to decide whether an attack is real before they have to decide whether to launch. And of course, if Russia launches an attack by mistake, we know where it's coming. It's coming over here. Um, so part of our rationale, justification, for the policy recommendations we have is to not only change US policy, but to encourage uh, Russian policy to change in a way that reduces stumbling into nuclear war, which is in our benefit. Thank you. Uh, I, let's see here, uh, Noah. Noah, ha Noah Johnson has another question. Let me uh, turn it back to you again, Noah. The United States has not tested a nuclear weapon since the George H.W. Bush administration. Do you believe that the laboratory directors will be able to certify the safety and reliability of the nuclear arsenal in perpetuity through the stockpile stewardship program? Or do you think the resumption of nuclear testing will be necessary at some point in the future? My own belief is that they will be able to continue the stockpile stewardship program, which has been exceedingly successful. There have been some arguments and the, the last time I talked to the lab directors, that's what they believed as well. But there's been some concern that in order to assure this on into the future, we should allow very low yield testing. And that's the, and if the question comes up, if we really get concerned about this problem, the um, option is always open to go into very, very low yield testing. And by that I mean, by low yield, I mean really low yield testing. So that is, a, that is an option to maintain, but as, as, as of this time, uh, there's every reason to believe that the, the um, stockpile stewardship program is, is working and we have required the lab director to each year write to the Secretary of Defense and certify, and certify that, that, that they're, con they're confident in the stockpile. So we have the situation, I think, under well, well under control and we also have a fallback position if it, ever, if it ever starts to get out of control. I would agree uh, wholeheartedly with that and just add that, you know, if, if the United States were to resume nuclear testing, that would ultimately be um, not, not in our benefit. I mean, look, the United States has conducted more nuclear tests than the rest of the world combined. Uh, we have the most sophisticated um, simulation program uh, in the world. So if we resume nuclear testing, which allows other nations to resume nuclear testing, they're going to advance more than, than we would. Uh, so the best way for us uh, to contain the proliferation of nuclear weapons and to contain uh, the uh, qualitative improvement of nuclear weapons uh, is to maintain a global ban on nuclear weapons, which is all the more reason why the United States needs to actually ratify the test ban treaty. Uh, which we have never done, and until we do the treat, until we do the treaty can't go into force. So there's a real priority here um, on the U.S. Senate uh, ratifying the test ban treaty. Just to make a final point on that, I believe it is it's very much in the U.S. national security interest to not be testing nuclear weapons, to not test nuclear weapons. And in view of that, I think it's, it'd be a very much international interest to join the, the, the test ban treaty. Thank you. We have time for one more question from our students and then I may uh, do a little moderator's prerogative and ask one of my own. But let me uh, finish up here with uh, Kurt, Kurt Klein. 
What additional risk or possible mitigations to risk of blundering into nuclear war might arise as we see advancements in artificial intelligence come about? Do you have any thoughts about what action should be taken? I think the most important action is to give the decision makers more time. Simply go away from the policy of being able to respond quickly to a presumed attack. We must give the decision makers more time. All of the problems you're describing in the history have argued that we need more time. But when you add to that, the dangers of cyber warfare coming into the picture, then it's all the more important that we take more time to make the decision. I cannot emphasize enough, we need more time in this decision. Tom? Uh, I completely agree. And I would just want to respond to some who have made arguments that in, in the days of, uh, of, of AI and, and, and cyber attacks on nuclear weapons systems and command and control, that we should make this, the process more automated. In other words, let AI decide uh, when and how the United States should use nuclear weapons and take the humans out of the loop. Uh, and I think that's completely the wrong way to go because any system is hackable, any system can be corrupted. Um, the last thing we wanna do is leave this up to computers uh, that we know are vulnerable. Uh, so not only do we wanna keep the human in the loop, we want more humans in the loop and we wanna create as much time for those humans to make a decision as possible. Thank you. Uh, so my own question, uh, I know you've been talking to the new administration. Uh, recognizing the reality of the political landscape of uh, how con Congress is working or not working these days, um, what is it you would recommend to the Biden administration as the first steps they could take, that they actually could uh, make some decisions on their own and reduce the risk of a nuclear disaster? The first step I would recommend is one they've already taken, which is to uh, extend the New START Treaty. Okay. They've done that already. The second step I would recommend is to put a pause in the so-called GBSD, the ground-based strategic deterrent. We're now in the process of completely building a completely new generation of ICBMs. And my strong recommendation of the Biden administration is to put a pause in that while you study what we need, when we need it, and what we should really be doing, because I think with the program we're on right now is a mistake. Tom? I would just agree with that and add just a few other things. Um, the Biden administration is working to get back into the Iran nuclear deal right now. Uh, this is the deal that, that froze and rolled back the Iranian nuclear program under the Obama administration and then the Trump administration withdrew. Uh, we need to get back into that, into that deal as soon as possible. Uh, the only other thing is I would add is that um, the Biden administration could move towards a no first use policy as it further continues its review of US, US nuclear policy. And also, as we said, uh, puts limits on the sole authority of the president to start nuclear war. This is not so much that we're concerned that President Biden uh, will do something uh, uh, untoward in this regard. Um, but that all presidents are human. They all make mistakes. And again, we need to act now to limit presidential authority uh, against the possibility of future unstable deciders. I have a nuanced difference with Tom on that one, one of those points, which is I think the, the Biden administration should go, instead of pushing for a no first two, should go to a sole purpose. The reason I argue that is I think a sole purpose is much easier to sell and I think it has essentially the same purpose, the same content, the same effect. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Perry. Thank you, Mr. Kalina. Um, I'd like to thank our party RAN students. I, as always, I'm tremendously proud to uh, be your dean and to hear from you. Uh, once again, thought-provoking, pushing hard, and, and difficult questions. So thank you very much. Finally, I'd like to uh, say thank you to our campaign chair, Joel Hyatt, for bringing us all together. And I'm going to turn it over to Joel now. Please join me in thanking Secretary Perry and Tom Kalina and our other participants today for that very interesting discussion. I also want to thank all of our RAND supporters, including Spencer Kim, who recently funded a fellowship in Secretary Perry's honor. We aim through the Capitol campaign, Tomorrow Demands Today, 
to give to Rand the capacity to continue to find the bold solutions that confront and address the most pressing problems facing our world today. And I believe Rand is uniquely able and willing to do so. Rand's rigorous, fact-based, evidence-based, science-based, public policy research and analysis is more needed today than ever before. Your support is helping Rand improve the security and safety, the health and well being of individuals and communities throughout the world. I encourage you to learn more about Rand by going to Rand.org. And on behalf of the entire Board of Trustees, thanks again for your participation and support. Times have changed since the creation of NATO and NASA the World Health Organization, and the World Bank. From colleges and courts to the military and the media are the many institutions we've relied on to keep us educated, safe, and informed still meeting our needs today. Technology has transformed our lives and changed the way we communicate. Speed and ease of transaction guide our high-tech world. But have they made us less safe? The networks that make it possible for you to connect with your family and friends around the world also connect terrorist groups and their followers. You can have groceries delivered with the push of a button, but there are also websites that trade in weapons and humans. Who is responsible when your self-driving car crashes? What happens when an algorithm denies you access to healthcare or a loan to start a business? From cyberspace to outer space, now is the time to rethink the roles and responsibilities of our institutions and our place in the world. Imagine a tomorrow where sound policy drives stability, prosperity, health, and well-being. Can you imagine a more secure tomorrow? We can. Tomorrow demands today.